this morning as the body of Christ. Let's stand to our feet as we begin our service and lift our voices and sing to the Lord this morning, how firm a foundation. Here we go. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Placerita Bible Church. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. We're kind of right in between that week, but we're glad you guys are here. Thanks for coming out and celebrating Jesus with us this morning, because that's what we're doing. Amen? Amen? All right, just making sure you guys are awake. You look a little bit like the Christmas blues, you know, kind of got like, hey, Christmas is still here. Jesus has been born, and he is alive, and he is coming back. So uh, we're excited to be together this morning. Every Sunday is a glorious day, the Lord's Day, where we get to worship Jesus together collectively as his body. And uh, we just want to welcome you to being here with us together this morning. I want to give you a couple of announcements if I can. And the first is from our youth director, Zach Harris. And he just wanted to let me, uh, ask me to let you guys know he's looking for a little help in the youth ministry. You know, from season to season, semester to semester, there's people who are available to serve. And uh, those people come and go. And he's looking for, let me just give you a list of a couple of kind of things he's looking for if you're interested in helping out. He's looking for a host home where staff meetings could be held and where students could hang out uh, at times with some staff. 
He's also looking for a worship leader on Wednesday nights. He's looking for a married couple or couples to help provide wisdom, counsel, and perspective uh, for the group that would be attending the Wednesday night meetings, uh, also on Sunday morning to help uh, plan and execute youth events, to help out with the youth room, keeping it clean and decorated. So if you just have a heart for youth ministry, maybe you're a younger couple, uh, maybe you're an older couple with students in the ministry, just know we'd love to have your help. And if you're interested in that, you could talk to me this morning, you could talk to Zach, I think he's out this morning, but you could talk with him as well by calling the church office. And we just always like to kind of beef up our youth staff. And uh, if that's you this morning or someone you think might be really good at that, make sure you let them know. We'd love to get them involved in our youth ministry. Then also, we wanted to let you guys know that starting on January the 10th, so not next week, but in two weeks, we're going to kick off kind of our normal winter schedule, which will include equipping hour, and we'll do equipping hour from 8.15 to 9.15. And then we're going to keep the main service this hour. So from 9.30 to 11 will be our main service. But we'll be beginning our equipping hour, not next Sunday because it's the first Sunday of the year, but the following Sunday where children's classes will, will be meeting, youth classes will be meeting. And then we've been talking about that adult equipping hour class where we'll be uh, addressing some difficult things that are happening in a changing world. And we'll be addressing that from God's word. So next week. Just like this week, 9.30 to 11, I'll be preaching uh, next week. This week, we have a special speaker that I'll be introducing in just a few moments. But we're excited about, uh, about uh, kicking off kind of the new year with all of our other ministries on that second Sunday, January the 10th. Also, we want to let you know that our PBC post office is uh, open today, which means if you didn't pick up your Christmas cards that we exchange as a family, uh, you can do that this morning. And then next week, um, that post office will be closed. So, uh, well, hey, if you have a Bible with you, let me invite you to open up to Psalm 119. We've been reading through this incredible psalm. I've been telling you a little bit about how every verse in Psalm 119 has a reference to the Bible, that we can trust God's Word, read God's Word, be shaped and changed by God's Word. And so why don't I invite you to stand with me in honor of God's Word. This morning we're looking at Psalm 119, and we'll read verses 33 through verse 4. 40. And here's what the psalmist writes. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. You may be seated. Father, we want to thank you this morning for the opportunity to come together as a church, to worship you, to sing songs to you, to sit under the preaching of the word, to hear the word of God read like Psalm 119. And we would pray along with the psalmist this morning that you would teach us your way today, God, that you would teach us your statutes, that we would be faithful to keep your word to the very end, that you would lead us in the path of your commandments, that we would take great delight in both listening to and obeying your word. Father, I pray that you would turn our eyes away from worthless things and that we would look to your word today and know that all of your rules are good. Your precepts give us life. And so help us to walk in the truth today. Help us to wrap up this year in a way that we would walk by faith and that we would be obedient to your word. And we want to pray, God, for our country this morning as we just consider all that America has been facing, all that the world's been facing. And we want to be a people that would turn our hearts back to you. God, we want to be a people that would be bold in our witness and in our faith. And we want to be a people who would give hope to a world by pointing them to Jesus Christ, who came as a baby and who lived a full life and who gave his life for us, that we could have new life because of the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. 
God, we want to pray for the other churches in our area. We're so thankful that we're here in Santa Clarita among many churches that preach your word and that hold high the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that you would be with our church as we consider uh, just wrapping up the years. A lot of people are excited about 2021, a brand new start to a brand new year. And we're excited about that because, Christ, you are the love of our life and you are the shepherd of our souls and we come together to worship you, Lord. We're not here to depend on our economy, or our health, or our government. We're not here to just uh, focus on temporal things. But we're here to have our hearts stirred this morning. We desperately need and want a touch from you. And we thank you that your presence is with us always. And so we're praying that today, God, that you would be with those in our church body that are traveling. Many have been sick. Uh, many are still recovering. And uh, many are just not sure what to anticipate again in 2021. And yet we know that you're in charge of it all and that you're sovereign over it all. And that gives us great comfort and great uh, opportunity today to walk again by faith. And so we're praying, God, that you would be glorified as we continue to sing songs. And as we sit under the preaching of the word, we pray that you would have your way in our hearts and in this place this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we continue. Sing.
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, and O oh my soul, worship Your holy name. Sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the And my time has come. Still, my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years, and then for it, song just titled Psalm 62, taken obviously from Psalm 62, is really just such a comforting modern hymn. The words, my soul finds rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against the foes, and I will not be shaken. Though lips may bless and hearts may curse and lies like arrows pierce me, I'll fix my heart on righteousness and look to him who hears me. Such comforting words. This week where we have celebrated the birth of our Lord, lots of us have had wonderful weeks with friends, family, things of that nature, but not everybody. Some of you in our body have struggled with difficulty, with illness. There's folks not here with us today. Uh, sometimes this time of year is a reminder of a significant loss or trial or hardship or a family division and disunity and things that can make it really difficult. And 
I just want you to know as a way of a word of encouragement this morning that, that you don't have to have had a wonderful, exultant, joyful week in order to be here this morning with us. Because we're here to be filled up with the promises of the word of God, to worship our Lord through singing, and to grab a hold of these truths. My soul finds rest in God alone. And the comfort that comes with that and the security that comes with that, it's, it's him. It's him alone. And we're here together today as the body of Christ to be built up and encouraged by that and to claim every one of those promises for ourselves because our Lord was born, lived, and died to give them to us. All right? Here we go. Let's sing. We'll get the tempo right on this one. My soul finds rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, my fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken. Though lips may bless and hearts may curse, and lies like arrows pierce me, I'll fix my heart on righteousness and look to him who hears me and oh praise him hallelujah my delight and my reward everlasting never failing my redeemer my God find rest my soul in God alone Amid the world's temptations Where evil seeks to take a hold I cling to my salvation The riches come and riches go Don't set your heart upon them The fields of hope in which I sow A harvest in heaven
Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet that tribute bring, ransom heal, restored, forgiven, evermore his praises sing. Alleluia, Alleluia, praise the everlasting King.
Amen. You guys may be seated. Thank you. Well, thanks for leading us again in worship this morning. It's great to be with you again today on the Lord's Day. Initially, our family was going to travel to Georgia over this break, and then just due to some of the health concerns and all that's going on, we decided to postpone that trip. But I had already lined up a guest speaker who was going to speak for us, and then we had to change that speaker due to the same type of situation that's going on. Uh, but I'm excited this morning to announce to you a young man who's preached here once before a few years back. His name is Josh Dogero. Let me tell you a little bit about Josh. Josh was a missionary in Italy for 11 years where he met his wife, who is Italian, and married her. Together they have three daughters and Josh and his family returned to the States eight years ago to study at the Master's Seminary. Right now, he currently teaches Bible at Legacy Christian Academy. And I think I can say, Josh, you're my kid's favorite teacher. And if they don't tell you that, then they're lying to you. All right? Now, they, they really love and appreciate Josh. He has a way of telling fun stories and in communicating God's truth in a very memorable way. In fact, I can't tell you how many times we're sitting at the table. I think I've told you this before. And they're like, hey, Dad, guess what Mr. Dojiro said today? And they'll tell me some incredible story and then how, how that relates to God's word. And so that's what Josh does. In addition to teaching the Bible at Legacy Christian Academy, he is the online professor of theology at the Master's Seminary. And all of that is just a little bit a part of what Josh is doing as he's still in school himself doing a Ph.D. in systematic theology. Long term, I believe Josh wants to be a pastor, potentially even go back to Italy and serve there. We're so thankful for Josh, who is a fun guy. He's a real guy, and he, lo and he really, really loves the Lord Jesus Christ. And so why don't you join me in welcoming Josh to the Plasterita Bible Church pulpit. Josh, come on up, man. Well, good morning. It is fantastic to be with you this morning. I'm, I'm thrilled. I was thinking um, how grateful I am. It's really an honor to be able to be a guest speaker. And I was mentioning this earlier because guest speakers are dangerous at times. They can come in and they can drop like a heretical bomb and then take off. And the church has to deal with the issues. Um, and so it's really, it's an honor to be asked um, to come and preach. I I love the text that you read this morning in Psalm 119. Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes, and I shall observe it, right? There's a, there's a law, there's a statute, there's word from God, and then there's action on our part. There's teach me so that I can observe it. Give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. It's not just a list of do's and don'ts, is it? It's teach me so that I can follow you. Teach me so that I can apply what I've learned to my life and be more like you, right? It's, that's, that's sanctification, isn't it? Little by little, day by day, we're becoming more like the Christ that saved us. We're becoming more like his image. Establish your word to your servant that I, uh, as that which produces reverence for you. And he goes on and on and on. I loved that. So would you bow with me in prayer? Um, asking the Lord to apply his word to our hearts this morning. Heavenly Father, we, we come before your word acknowledging, Lord, that we are not there yet. We're not perfect. We're, we're far from it, Lord. And we want to look deeply into your word. And, and Lord, we want to walk away from here today different because we've We've looked deeply into your face, into your word. Lord, we, we don't want to just know stuff, or the devil knows stuff, and it doesn't help him, Lord. We want, to, we want to learn about you so that we can be different. So help us, Lord, to look at our own lives. Help us to examine our own lives. And Lord, help us to repent if we need to repent. Help us to turn towards you if we've never done that, Lord, if this is the first time for some people who have heard the gospel, our prayers, that they would turn towards you. But Lord, help us to not be the same. In your name we pray, amen. Well, this is Awkward Week. I don't know if you've ever thought that before. As a kid, I thought this was Awkward Week. This is the one week out of the year that just didn't fit for me. It's like a puzzle piece and you can't figure out where it goes. It's between Christmas and New Year's and there's just like there's no purpose to it. 
right? You, you, had, you had this major ramp up towards Christmas, and, and it starts way back in November with the, the progressive versus the traditionalist argument that runs through every family. And the progressives, they're the ones who want to decorate early, put the Christmas music on before Thanksgiving, and my family is full of progressives. Uh, I feel like I'm the, the lone traditionalist holding back the, the flood as it comes because I, I think there's a season for everything and there's a time for everything and you can't start before Thanksgiving, right? Because Thanksgiving has to have its place and I'm a progressive. I'm one of the old school, the old guard maybe. I mean, I'm a traditionalist. I said that wrong. This year though, hasn't 2020 changed the way we look at things a little bit? This year I became a progressive traditionalist. <laughs> And we decorated early and we set up early. But you get this ramp up that starts early November and it's building. And it builds like a snowball, right? And it, it keeps coming. And then at school, there's usually Christmas plays and there's all kinds of stuff going on. And there's the ramp up. It keeps building. The excitement's, you know, flowing. And then you get to Christmas Day. And then at like 10, 26 in the morning on Christmas, it just, it dies. <laughs> it's done, right? And, and how funny and fickle we are because then as kids, we sat there going, well, now what? And you've got a mountain of new toys to play with. I believe even one of my own daughters said yesterday, well, what do we do now? Um, what's the plan, right? Because it's over. But, and you're kind of waiting for New Year's, but there's no buildup for New Year's. New Year's just comes. Um, awkward week, I called it. Awkward week. But here's what awkward week does for us. It allows us to look back at the Messiah that came for us, right? We've just come off of that. We sang songs about it this morning. The Christ who came at the right time to be born, and not just to be born, but to die, right? Behind, behind the manger, there's a cross, and he came to seek and save the lost. And so we worship that, and we love that, and we, we sing songs to that, and we're excited about it. But Awkward week lets us look back to that. Not only that, but then we get to look back at 2020, right? We look back at the year that we've just come through, and, and we get to see, well, usually, usually we're, we're looking at the things that we wanted to do that, that uh, maybe we didn't get to do. Usually, we're looking back at, at the things that we've done, sometimes with regret. I didn't act the way that I wanted to, and this year, I didn't respond how I wanted to. I want to be a little different next year. And so you get this, this look back at 2020, and then you look forward at, at the year to come. So in our case, 2021 right now. And people make resolutions, right? People start thinking, well, I want to do something a little differently. And sometimes they're, they're pathetic resolutions. Let's be honest. If Jonathan Edwards, 200 years ago, wrote down in one of his resolutions, I want to get in shape, no one would read that 200 years later, right? No one would care. But Jonathan Edwards wrote things like this. This was I, number 17 on his list, resolved to live as I shall wish I had done when I come to die. I want to live thinking, what will it be like when I'm, I'm 90 and on my deathbed and I'm looking back? I want to live happy when I'm 90. I want to live as I wish I would have lived or I, I want to have lived. And, and he had this idea of time that I love. So he had this idea that his feet are on the precipice of eternity. And, and there's the cliff. And, and it could be a moment from now that I enter into eternity. So how will I live now? If you're going to make resolutions for 2021, check out, check out Jonathan Edwards first. Don't write down silly things that no one will want to read 200 years from now, right? But be resolved. That's what, that's what Awkward Week does for us, right? It allows us to look back and reflect on the past and then look forward, pushing towards change, something different. That's what I want to do with you. And the text that I want to look at with you today is ultimately Matthew 2. So open there first. Open to Matthew 2. And I want you to keep your finger there um, as we then flip to 1 John 4. Um, Matthew 2, we're going to be looking at, ultimately we're looking at one Messiah, but two reactions. One Messiah, two responses. Um, 
But I think Matthew, or uh, 1 John chapter 4, kind of sets us up for the argument. 1 John 4, um, I think, was written for Awkward Week. I don't think John had Awkward Week in mind necessarily, but it's this backwards-looking, forward-pushing attitude. We look back and we drive forward, and, and um, Matthew, or I'm sorry, 1 John 4 is where we're going to go to, to start. This is just going to set the table for us. This is just going to introduce the subject for us today. So 1 John chapter 4. Now, if you grew up in a church, uh, any kind of VBS environment like I did, 1 John 4, 7 and 8 is forever stuck in your memory. Uh, For me, it was stuck in there in the King James Version because it was a song. Uh, I don't know if you want to admit that you know it, but it went, beloved, let us love one another. Then there's background singers, love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love, God is love. Beloved, let us love one another, First John 4, 7, and 8. There it is. There it is. It stays with you, right? The Word of God stays with you, especially when you learn it in song. Now let me read it. By the way, here's my prayer for for you today. Um, My prayer is that we look in God's Word as a mirror. Mirrors, I think, are the ultimate enemy of humanity, right? When you look at a mirror, it's not trying to be your friend. A mirror is not going to build you up. It's not going to tell you lies. Uh, and the mirror tells you exactly how you are, exactly how you are. And if you've got something on your face, the mirror tells you that. It doesn't hold back, right? And so when you look at a mirror, if you're wise, and I'm sure most of you looked at a mirror at some point this morning, um, you looked at it and you realized something needed to change. You looked at it and you, you put into practice or you put into action the thing that you got from the mirror. And God's word is the same way. And the message we're going to look at today is very similar to that. And and I hope you look into the mirror and see who you are, right? And only you can look deeply into that. And only God can reveal to you your heart. I can't know it. Um, But my prayer for you is that you would look deeply into the mirror that doesn't lie. And that your heart would be convicted or your heart would rejoice because of it. But let's read 1 John 4, um, 7 to 10 for right now. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And by this, the love of God was manifested in us or among us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We're going to stop there for a moment. So this is, the, this is the look back moment, right? This is the awkward week moment where John is looking back, again, not because it's awkward week, but he's looking back. And he says, by this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So this is where John looks back. This is where we get to look back at Christmas Day and, and we look back and we think about the fact that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. By the way, I think verse 8, which I just skipped, I think verse 8 is one of the scariest verses in the Bible. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. The one who does not love. Love is a big deal. This is the Apostle John. John talks about love so much. If you flip back, uh, just look at chapter 2, verse 5. But whoever keeps his word in him is, or in him the love of God has truly been perfected. Look at verse 10. The one who loves his brother abides in light. Look how many times he says love. Look at verse 15 of chapter 2. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Chapter 3, verse 1, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. Are you feeling the theme here? He keeps coming back to it. Verse 10 of chapter 3, at the end. Well, let's read the whole verse 10. By this, the children of God and the children of of the devil are obvious. 
Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Verse 11, for this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Verse 14, at the end, he who does not love abides in death. Verse 23, this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. Over and over, and you hear Jesus, the echo of Jesus' words, how will they know that we're his disciples? By our love. Jesus said, you can hear, and this is, this is written some 30-ish years after Jesus' resurrection, give or take. This is around 90 AD, between 90 and 95 is what most scholars think. So this is, this is a long time after Jesus, yet you hear the echo of Jesus' very words in John. And you get to this little text that just kind of sets us up this morning. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And by this, the love of God was manifested in or among us. By this, so now here's the definition of love. Not, not like you would see in Wikipedia under the definition of love. Not like you would look up in Webster's Dictionary. But how do you know that God loves you? By this. By this, the love of God was manifested, made clear, made visible among us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. How do you know God loves you? He sent his son. The next verse says, to be the propitiation for our sins, to satisfy the wrath of God because of our sins. So let's take the rest of this morning and look back. But just so you can see where we're going, look at verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So there's our forward looking. So we look back at what Christ did. We look at back at what he's done. Not only, not only when 2,000 years ago when he was born and came to live, to die, to be the propitiation for our sins, but then because of that, because of his love for us, now we should love one another. And we look forward at 2021 as being a year marked by love. It should be a lifetime marked by love, right? But let's look back to look forward. So now let's go ahead and go back to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Our main text is here this morning. It's a simple passage. You guys know this story all too well. But what we're going to look at, is, uh, we're going to be confronted with two contrasts here. I want us to look at a contrast of character and then a contrast of heart. Contrast of character and a contrast of heart. And before we dig into it, let me ask you this general question just for you to be kind of thinking through, let it roll around in your brain as we're going through the text. But are you more like the Magi who came to worship or are you more like Herod who came with a sword? Who are you like? And I fear that most of us would say, well, I'm not like Herod. I don't want Jesus to die. I don't want to kill Jesus. I'm definitely more like the Magi. Let's see about that. Let's look into it. So Matthew chapter 2. Let me read verses 1 to 6 for us. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what was written by the, prophet, by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, king of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. We have two different kinds of people. We've got Herod, he's, I'm going to call him the antagonist, and we've got the Magi. But they're really, Matthew is setting them up in, in contrast one to the other. And, and it's interesting, both of these people, Herod and the Magi, they're, they're not from Israel. They're not, they're not 
Jews. They're from outside. Herod, you need to know a little bit about Herod. Herod was, um, Herod was an Edomite. Uh, the Edomites were the descendants of the line of Esau, and they lived to the south a little bit of Israel. There was always a little bit of conflict between the Edomites and the Israelites. He's an Edomite. And in 135 BC, Edom was conquered, and the inhabitants were forced to either convert or leave. So, so he comes from a, a line of people who have converted, but they're not originally from Israel. In fact, he's not converted, even though he probably would say he is even though he would probably say at this point he's grown up in, uh, in Jewish traditions and Jewish beliefs, and he would probably say that uh, maybe like me when I was a kid just growing up going to church, well, I'm there, I'm in, right? I go to church. I didn't really care much about church, to be honest. As I sat there and we had, we had bulletins, and I told this to my students at Legacy, I, I used to sit there um, I probably wouldn't have admitted that I didn't really care at the time. That's not how I would have said it. But I sat there with my bulletin, and I would, I would just like fill in all the letters, all the O's, and I would just kind of pencil them in, and all the E's, and I would just sit there. The, the message for me was over my head. That was my excuse. It was because I didn't really necessarily want to listen to it. Um, I would say that's probably Herod. Herod was probably that kid in the synagogue if they had bulletins when he would go in. Herod's family um, stayed in Edom, so they were forced to convert, and Herod was raised Jewish. Although he probably affirmed the Jewish religion, he didn't care about it, and his lifestyle doesn't prove it, right? It's easy to say things, and we're going to hear Herod in a little bit say things, say things that are right, say things that are true, and yet be lying while he's saying them. We're going to look at that in a moment. In 43 BC, Mark Anthony uh, makes um, him a ruler of Israel, makes him king. So he's not a born king. He's not of a kingly line. He is merely made king by Mark Anthony. He's also a very paranoid king. He's afraid that people are conspiring to take his throne. So he actually has his wife and, and some of his family members murdered because he thinks they're trying to take his power from him. That's Herod. In class, we call him Cray Cray Herod, right? Um, so he's just, this is Herod. He's paranoid. He's on this side. On this side, we've got the Magi. The Magi were stargazers. They, were, they practiced a little bit of mystic stargazing, a little bit of, they thought magic involved in it. Uh, they did not love Yahweh. They were not worshipers of Yahweh. However, we can trace the Magi back to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel in the Old Testament was actually part of the Magi. He was made one of the leaders of the Magi. And he's the one who prophesied when Jesus would enter into Jerusalem to be cut off from his people. So they were, interestingly, expecting Daniel's Messiah to come. They were looking for it. So when they see the star rise, they know what's going on. Herod's not looking for it, but these non-worshippers of Yahweh are looking for it. So these are our two characters today. These, this is the contrast of character. We've got on the one side a leader, a ruler, who doesn't want to give up his power. He wants life his own way. He enjoys life his own way and doesn't want to change in any way. On the other side, we've got the Magi. Um, the Magi who leave family who leave culture, who leave language, who leave community, who leave their cats and dogs. They leave everything behind to go find Jesus. And we get in Matthew chapter 2, going back, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived. Interesting, it says in verse 1 that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The Magi arrive in Jerusalem. It's only a couple miles apart, but they're in a different place. The king lives in Jerusalem. The king's palace is in Jerusalem. We don't know exactly how many Magi there were. There were probably closer to, closer to a thousand, some people have speculated, that came with the Magi that day. They had their own standing army. Uh, they, they would have come in dressed like kings, they're not kings. We sing we three kings, but that's absolutely false. They're just, they're just coming to find Jesus. I imagine Herod that day is probably on his throne in Jerusalem, excited. 
I think he would have been excited. These magi are coming to meet me. I'm the king of Israel. It's right. It's just that they come to me. But look what it says. End of verse two, Magi from the East, or verse one, Magi from the East arrived in Jerusalem saying, and that verb saying, it indicates that they were repeatedly saying. They were saying over and over. So as they came into Jerusalem, they were asking everyone that they could see, do you know where he is? Where is the one who was born king of the, where is he at? Do you know where he's at? Right? They're constantly asking over and over. And now it's starting to trouble Herod. Why would it trouble him? Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Herod was not born king. This is a different king. This is someone that Herod's not expecting. What's his reaction? Verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. King of Israel, king of the Jews, and he has no idea where Jesus, the Messiah, is to be born. The people apparently didn't know because the, because the, the Magi keep asking them as they go along, where is he? And the people don't know. So, so Herod's got to pull a think tank together. The chief priests and the scribes, where is he? And, and I want you to see his character, right? He doesn't know. He, he has no idea. Christmas, for a lot of you, might be like that. It's all about the stockings and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and, and um, singing Christmas songs. But the thought that Messiah is coming, is that on your radar? And I hope it was. I, I love Christmas time. Christmas time for me is a time to ponder deeply. It, the king of kings steps off his throne. He who created everything. John 1 says there's nothing that's been created that he didn't create. And he steps off that throne, not because he has to, not because he's forced to, because he wants to. And he who is timeless, he who has created all of creation, breaks into time. He who is timeless becomes creation. He who has angels singing around him day and night since they were created, he leaves that, he leaves the praises of angels to step into humanity, to take on humanity, to add humanity to who he is so that he could be ridiculed by humanity, so that he could be spit upon, so that he could have a crown of thorns smashed onto his head, so that he could die on a cross. Christmas is a time to marvel. Let it sink in. That he who is outside of time stepped into time to die in time to save you for all time. That blows my mind away. And every year I go back to the same thought because I can never get over it enough. I never wrap my mind around it that, that he would do that for me, a sinner. Herod isn't expecting it. The Magi are. They don't really know what, they don't know everything, but they leave everything to come find him. Contrast of characters. Where do you fit? Where do you fit? Are you more like the Magi who are willing to leave everything, family, country, community, culture, life, give it all up and say, that's the pearl of great, that's what I want. That's the greatest thing that has ever happened and could ever happen. And I'm willing to say no to everything for that. That's the Magi. Have you done that? Or there's Herod. Wait, what? I'm a, a Messiah? How did I miss that? Let me get the scribes together. Where's he, where's he gonna be born? What's the deal? Contrast of character. Let's look at the contrast of heart. Contrast of heart. This is going to be verse 7 and kind of on. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time that the star appeared. And when he had sent them to Bethlehem, he said, Go, search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me that I too may come and worship him. 
After hearing the king, they went on their way. And the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, to Herod, the Magi left their own country by another way. Let's talk about just the Magi for right now. They have no idea that the baby's in Bethlehem, so, so King Herod tells them the baby's in Bethlehem, and then they go. They go towards Bethlehem. It's only about five miles away. How did they respond? See, now we get the contrast of heart the response, which already we can kind of see their response in the fact that they left about two years before, two years or less before. They left in the east. They got on their camels. They, they didn't have comfortable cars like us. They slept in tents. They slept out in the open because their hearts were driving them to find Jesus. Now, what does it say? Verse 10, when they saw the star, what did they do? They rejoiced. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They didn't just say, they didn't just pick up a guitar, make up a little song, I'm bringing you my little drum roll, Jesus, pum 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 pum, and then they went away, which would have been a nightmare for any mom, right? They didn't just put a picture of Jesus or a Bible verse on their wall in their house. They didn't slap a WWJD bracelet on their wrist. They didn't try to just stop saying bad words here and there, right? That's our typical modern day Christian is just kind of a masked Christian. They didn't, they didn't act like that, did they? They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. I love that combination of words. Matthew could have just said, and they were happy. Matthew could have said they were joyful. He could have said uh, they were beside themselves, but they rejoiced exceedingly beyond normal, and they did it with great joy. This isn't, they've come for two years. There's the one that we've given everything up for. We found him. And they open up their own gifts, and they're giving gifts to Jesus. We love gifts. I love getting gifts. Are you kidding me? Gifts are fun. But they didn't come, right? They're fun. It's, it's great to get gifts. Let's be honest. Christmas is cool. But it's not just about getting the gift. Here, they didn't get gifts. They did. They came to see the greatest gift. And the response to that is they gave gifts. Right? What do you give? How do you give the king who has everything, how do you give him something? Talk about having a hard person to find gifts for, right? He's got it all. But what, what you give him is you, right? You give him your heart. You give him your life. You press on to follow him because he changes everything about you. Everything for the magi. And I don't know what they went back to. We don't know how they went back. We don't know their, their, the after story right? The part two. But here's what we know. They came to worship. They didn't come to just plop down a Christmas present and say Merry Christmas and then walk away. They came to worship. They gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh, royal gifts, gifts to kings. That's what they gave Jesus. What would you give if you got to meet a king and you had to give a gift? They gave the best of what they could. contrast of heart starts with them and you see their heart and their heart is sold out 100% on fire determined they've left everything to come find this Jesus and there's peril there's danger in the trip right they can't, they had their own army so I guess it wasn't that dangerous for them maybe but they come after giving up everything and leaving behind everything to find the one thing that mattered and when they found him they rejoiced exceedingly over the top bubbling joy with great joy. And they gave him stuff. That's the Magi. Herod. Let's look, talk about him. 
back up to verse 7. Remember, Herod, Herod was more like a Messiah? What? Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And we know if you skip down to verse 16, the fact that he kills all the male children in Bethlehem and in its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he determined from the Magi, means the star rose about two years before, and they took off to follow the star. So, side note, in our house, we usually don't put the Magi with the nativity scene because they came later, so we put them like somewhere else because they're, they're starting to come, but they're not there yet. Unfortunately, our Magi get to baby Jesus the day we pack up and we put Christmas stuff away, but they get there. Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and he said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. Friends, what he says here is spot on. What he says here is Christianese, right? What he says here is the things that we know how to say. Oh, go find him. Hallelujah, Jesus is born. Amen. I want to worship him too. Doesn't it, isn't that right? I'm not talking about his heart. We know his heart is completely off, but his words are spot on. That's scary to me. Our words can be spot on, but our hearts can be completely in a different place. And when someone asks you, are you a Christian? Your words can be spot on, but your heart can be in a different place. And I don't know, maybe young people... Like me, I grew up going to church. I knew the answers. I read my Bible. I could speak it, but my heart wasn't there. Not until later on, not until the Lord showed me my heart. I was oblivious to my own heart until the Lord opened my eyes. So my challenge for you, especially young people, are you like Herod? Do you know the things that you should say, but then you just kind of bury it? So he says the right words. Now skip down to skip down to verse 16. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, that cracks me up, by the way. Herod's been tricked because back in verse 7 and verse 8, we know Herod's tricking the Magi. He says, Go, I want to worship Jesus. He doesn't mean a word of it. He's trying to trick them. He's trying to use them as spies. And yet now, verse 16, Herod realizes that he's been tricked and he becomes enraged. And sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem in its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time he had determined from the Magi. What's Herod's heart? What's Herod's heart? Now, I don't think any of us would ever be willing to say, I'd like to kill Jesus. None of us would. We know that's wrong. But what's actually Herod's heart here? Herod's heart is, I like, I like life the way it is, right? I'm selfish. I like my power and I don't want to share it. I like my glory and I don't want to give it away. I like doing what I want to do and I don't want to have to be someone else. I don't want my life transformed by Jesus. I don't want Jesus to mess with, with who I am. I like my sin and I want to keep doing it. Isn't that Herod's heart? Now, Herod's a king, so he has at his disposition anything and everything that he wants to do to keep his heart the way it is. So he tries to kill Messiah. He tries to kill God's chosen one. And we don't have that possibility. But what we can do is turn our backs to it. We can turn away from it. We can say, but I like the way I am. I don't want to be sanctified. I don't want to be changed. I don't want to be different. I kind of like me, and I kind of like life the way it is. And I think all too often, we would never go as far as Herod, but I think if we had to put the Magi on one end of a spectrum, I kind of imagine in my mind this like spectrum, the Magi over here, totally 100% devoted. That's their heart. On the other end of the spectrum, Herod, totally 100% selfish. I think we're somewhere in the middle. And I think that can fluctuate at times, probably on how much time you spend in God's word, how much time you spend pursuing Christ, 
how serious you are about following Christ, not just like someone who puts a verse on the wall and a WWJD bracelet on and, and you try to act Christian in front of others. Here we have transformed heart and we have hypocritical heart, right? Where are you in that? Where are you in that? Before we, before we go back to 1 John to conclude, I just want us to think about this. Herod was feigning righteousness. He faked it. But he faked it in front of people that was convincing, right? The Magi took off to, to go find Jesus because Herod had convinced them. He, he was a worshiper too. How do we know? I mean, even just thinking back, actually, let's go to, let's, you know what, let's just do this. Let me, do I have enough time? Luke chapter 2, we're good. Dinner's not till late, right? And I do mean dinner, not lunch dinner. I mean dinner. Look, I just, want to, I just want to emphasize one other set of contrasts. Like just to add one more, we've got shepherds. You, you know the story. You know this, right? The shepherds are out in their field. They're sh the shepherds, I, I think, are like you and me, right? They're, they're the average guy. They're not expecting change. They're not expecting anything different. They're doing what they do every day. And they weren't expecting Messiah to come, but he came. How did they respond to Messiah? Look at, I guess we'll just get a running start at it. Verse 10, and the angel said to them, you know, the angels showed up and pff, they're afraid, greatly afraid, terribly afraid. Verse 10, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. This is good news. This isn't just news. This is good news of great joy. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you and you will find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, again, this is, they're saying over and over to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So there's excitement. They're starting to talk to each other. Did, did you guys see? Did, is mine the only one that saw the angel show up there? That, I was scared. And he, let's go find out. Should we do that? Let's go. And the Bible doesn't say whether or not we talked about, our family talked about this on Christmas Day. Did they leave the sheep or not? We don't know. But it does say, let us go straight to Bethlehem, verse 16. So they came in a hurry. I think they left the sheep because you can't go in a hurry with sheep. That's what I think. The Bible doesn't say. They found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he was in the manger. Here's their reactions. Listen, when they'd seen this, they made known the statement which had been told to them by this child. The first reaction they have is they talk about it. You guys won't believe this. Angels just showed up and this is this. Mary, I don't know if you know this. That's the Savior. He came to save us. This is good news for all people, right? Then you get... Verse 18, and all who heard it wondered at the things which they were told them by the shepherd. But Mary treasured these things, pondering them in her heart. Here's the shepherds again. They went back, listen to this, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen just as it had been told them. So we could even add another contrast of character, contrast of heart. Where are you on that spectrum? Where are you? Go back to 1 John chapter 4. We've looked back. We've done what you must do in awkward week. We look back. But we look back marveling. Look at what, look at what God did. At the right time, he sent his son. Verse 9, by this the love of God was manifested in or among us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live. That we might live. Not just that we would be better people. Not just that we would be more moralistic people. Not just that we would be nicer people. But that we could live, friends. 
that should cause goosebumps to come up and down your arms. You should get excited about that. He sent his, that's love. All too often we try to define love on our own terms. Well, what you just said to me wasn't very loving, right? We define it like that. Like I want what I want for love to be. Instead, John defines it like this. God loved us. How do you know? He sent his son at the right time. He loved us. Verse 10, in this is love. Here's the definition. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He sent his son to die on the cross for your sins and my sins so that we could be saved from this sinful world and we could be saved to him. We still live in a sinful world. We still sin, but we're saved from, we're saved from the penalty of hell, friends, and we're saved to a a relationship with God, to being reconciled with the Father. We're saved to life from death. And I don't don't know most all of you. This text for us screams two different things for two different kinds of people. Listen, if you're here today and you're saved, you've, you've thrown yourself at the mercy of God, you've agreed with God, and you said, God, I agree with you, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve to be, to be saved to life. I don't deserve any of that. But your son died on the cross to save me. Would you forgive me of my sins? If that's you, and we think about this contrast of character and contrast of heart, where are you on that? If you're saved and you're thinking about yourself on that spectrum, be honest with yourself. Lord, I would love to be like the Magi, but at times I find myself a bit more like Herod, comfortable with my own sin. Forgive me. What a great time. You're looking in the mirror of God's word, and just like when you looked in the mirror this morning and you saw that that there was something wrong with your face or something wrong with your hair, and you made a decision to change that, just like that, look into the mirror of God's word, and you can say, Lord, forgive me. Thank you for saving me. Forgive me for those times when I'm selfish. And then verse 11 of 1 John applies to you. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Press on towards loving one another. Press on. When you find yourself acting more like Herod, it doesn't mean you're out of the family. It means you need to say, I'm sorry. Ask forgiveness and press on. But friend, if you're here today and and you have never asked forgiveness, you're, you're not a believer, and you say, you know what, I'm not like the Magi, and I see that. I haven't given up everything to follow Christ, and I haven't asked forgiveness for my sins. This text cries out to you, repent. Repent of your sins. Repent of your wayward ways. Don't be like Herod trying to suppress Christ and push Christ away when you know the truth, because you know in your heart the truth that at the right time, God sent his son to die for you. And my challenge too is to young people, look in the mirror and look hard. I was growing up in church like you and it wasn't until I was around 13 or 14 that I started actually thinking through things and I knew answers. I knew how to say the right things like Herod, but it wasn't there. I could talk it, I could say it, I could sing it, right? I could take notes on it. Where are you on that spectrum? And if you haven't asked forgiveness for your sins, you're definitely on the Herod side. But it's not too late. Scripture says today is the day of salvation. Call out and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Repent, and repentance means turning away from, right? So if if you've been walking in one direction and that direction has been away from Christ and you realize Christ saved, Christ came to die for my sins, and you ask forgiveness for your sins, turn away from that direction and press on to follow Christ. Enter into his love and his joy. I think about, I think about uh, Moses in uh, Deuteronomy 31. Moses says, this day I have placed before you life and death. This day I have placed before you life and death. Maybe that's not where it's at. I'm drawing a blank. But he says, I've placed before you life and prosperity, death and adversity, in that I command you today, I love this, I command you to love 
Love the Lord your God. Walk in his ways. Keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments. Listen, it's not about keeping a set of rules. It's loving God. Moses says, I've placed before you life and death. Choose life. And so if you're here today and you've never chosen life, choose life. Ask forgiveness for your sins. Turn away from them and follow hard after Christ and you will live. And then you can look forward to 2021 and you can say, God, help me love as you have loved. Help me to love others as you have loved. As you sent your son to die for me, help me to have that same sacrificial love attitude towards others so that we as a body of Christ can testify here in Placerita Canyon and all around that Christ came for me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you're so good to us. You've given us your word, and in your word, Lord, as we read today, Matthew contrasts two hearts and two characters, and even Luke brings in the shepherds, and we can add them to this contrast. Lord, we love you. Lord, we're amazed that you would send your son from heaven to earth to die for sinners like us. Sometimes we have this overinflated idea of who we are. Sometimes we think, of course God died to save for us. <laughs> Christ died to save us. We're good, but we're not good, Lord. We're far from it. We thank you that your son stepped off his throne willingly, and he took on humanity willingly, and he stepped into time willingly, out of love, to die on a cross, a death that we all deserve, to give us life that none of us deserve. Lord, help us to be blown away by that. Help us to be changed by that. And Lord, help us in 2021 to be moved by that, to love and good deeds. Lord, I pray for those who may have never given their life to you. Lord, I pray that they would. I pray that you would, Lord, that you would explode their hearts right now to a desire to know you more. And Lord, I pray that they would not leave here today the same people that they came in as because we've looked deeply in your word. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together as we conclude our service this morning, and let's sing, All I Have is Christ. was lost in darkest night you thought I knew the way the sin that promised joy in life and led me to the grave I had no that you would hold a rebel to your will and if you As I run my hellbound race, indifferent to the cause, you looked upon my helpless days and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love display, you suffered in my place.
follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my rights of life in any way you choose and let my soul We sing that because it's true on days when we are so aware of it and others less so, but it's always true. You are all that we have. Lord, thank you so much for humbling yourself to be born as a baby, utterly and totally dependent, and to live a perfect life, to fulfill all righteousness, and then to die in our place, Lord, so that anyone, no matter who they are, no matter their circumstance, who turns and looks to you will find you to be a perfect and powerful and sovereign Savior. Lord, I pray that uh, we would take, the heart, uh, take to heart the preaching of your word this morning, that we would seek to, by your grace, be like those that sought you with true hearts, seeking not to preserve for ourselves our own life or lifestyle, and certainly not sin, but to pursue you at all costs. We love you so much, Lord. I pray that you would bless this week as we would seek to live it in holiness and to practice the one another's for your honor and glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys are dismissed. Have a great week.